Hello, this is Dustin Goes to Hollywood again. Uh, this is, as you can tell by the title, part two of uh, our season four finale on The Shining. So if you haven't heard part one yet, it should be in your feed. Uh, you can go back and listen to that one. That one we talked mostly about uh, The Shining, the movie from uh, 1980. And this one we're going to be talking about um, a lot of the uh, other media related to The Shining, like uh, the documentary Room 237. Um, the sequel, Dr. Sleep, the miniseries that came out in the 90s, pretty much everything <laughs> other than The Shining, the movie. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. It's a little bonus that we decided to tag on just to really round out uh, the season four finale with uh, this banger of an episode. So hope you enjoy. Let's talk about the the other media the associated media as i like to call it because there's so much around this movie that we have to talk about um i want to talk about room 237 um i want to talk about the making the shining documentary from uh, vivian kubrick uh i want to talk a little bit about dr sleep and i want to talk about the shining mini series that was made for tv so let's talk real quick about 237 yeah you're gonna have to take the reins on a lot of this because i've like i said i finished The Shining today before doing this and I had enough time to watch maybe 45 minutes of Room 237. Okay. Uh, and nothing else. Uh, TV series I saw years ago, but everything else you just said, I'm completely blind on. So 237, um, we talk, I you know, we briefly talked about it earlier. I think this documentary is total horseshit. Um, I think it has some interesting points that it makes uh but most of it is utter just bullshit like the whole did you get to the part where they talk about omen having a boner while he's shaking jack's hand yes, in the interview it seemed like so, so dumb every single one of them <laughs> seemed uh really like it was really reaching like they're just trying to it's, find subliminal just yeah. to do it it's like an english teacher there's that meme of like the 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 book says the curtains are blue and the English teacher is like oh they the curtains are blue because it represents you know Jack's soul and everything and the writer's like no the the curtains are just fucking blue yeah that's like, just what we chose yeah like the, I, a lot of that stuff like oh you know there's this dissolve and in the dis- the dissolve you can see there are people inside the suitcases like we like they would be if you chopped up a body like it's so so far up its own ass that it it can't see the forest for the trees was- like. I was looking at one where, like, they were, like, right out in the opening scroll Mm -hmm. uh, when it says, uh, produced and directed by Stanley Kubrick, the frame right when his name leaves the screen, Mm -hmm. a picture of Stanley Kubrick is airbrushed into the clouds, and I'm like... I don't see it. uh, Yeah. I was like, I don't... I'm looking. I don't see it. I I couldn't see it. Yeah. Um, And, you know, I, I think... I think there there are things Kubrick is trying to say with The Shining um, when it comes to like the subtlety of the art direction and stuff, like the um, the cans of uh, with the the Native American on it. Yeah. Um, but I, I just think a lot, like you said, a lot of the stuff is just people latching. They're latching onto the wrong thing. So you know what I mean. The only part of that uh, of that segment that I was kind of mm-hmm. on was we are introduced to Doc and it's him first talking. To Danny through the shining, yeah, it's a peace pipe thing. I liked that, but then the next part where Jack's in the pantry when he said that they're all facing different ways and all that stuff, and I'm like, okay, you're yeah. reaching too far out. No, the 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 one it's it's funny. I have one big thing I take away from this documentary that I'm like, yes, you nailed it. That's absolutely right. And another thing that I'm like, you are the biggest fucking idiot when it comes to this stuff is let's talk about the big thing the big thing is the dopey sticker did you get to this part no of the documentary all right uh i'm gonna play a clip here uh this is mostly just a visual thing so you're not really missing anything if you're listening but um when we first see danny in the in the bathroom brushing his teeth talking to tony he has these stickers on his wall like snoopy woodstock everything like that mickey mouse and he has dopey one of the dwarves the seven dwarves from snow white uh, on this wall and the camera's pushing in you know it's danny talking to tony he's like hey you what's going on with dad oh he got the interview yeah he's got the job blah 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 after um danny and tony danny has that vision with tony 
and t- he says, you know, what's at the hotel? I, I'm not supposed to say, come on, just please. And Danny sees the vision of, you know, the blood elevator, the Grady sisters and everything. Um, right. That's his first time. And then when they cut back after he faints, you know, the doctors and all that leave his room. Right. The dopey sticker is the only one missing off of his door. Right. Like every other sticker is there, but the dopey yeah. one's missing, which is, you know, I – it, they make this clear in the documentary, and I do think this is intentional, that it's Doc losing his innocence. Like, now that he's seen the visions of the Overlook, that he's no longer you mean just- Danny like lost a, his innocence? Did I say Dopey? No, you said Doc. <laughs> well, I said Doc. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he's no, he's no longer innocent, you know? Like, the Dopey sticker represents that. I do think that's intentional, because it's the only sticker missing. Okay. And uh, it's, it's too- it's too specific to be coincidental, I think. Yeah. I, I could see something like – it's not just a can of product that's turned a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But then there's the antithesis of that, which I think is the funniest part of this fucking documentary that's unintentional because the guy is totally serious. This is where we're talking about – um. The moon landing, right? That there's this famous conspiracy theory that Stanley Kubrick faked this, the moon landing, and he used The Shining as a way to confess to America and the world that he did it, yeah, right? With uh, the sweater, right? There's the sweater, and then there's all sorts of other things, right? Um, the 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 it's it's reaching a bit, but it's like, oh, the carpet represents the landing pad of the rocket or whatever. It's it's real dumb, but there's a scene. I'll just let the scene play out, and again, this is this is more audio based, so I'll just play the scene. Um, but they're talking; it's the it's the guy talking about the the moon landing conspiracy theory, and he's talking about the key, specifically the key to room two thirty seven. Uh, so let's just let's just take a listen real quick. There is a key in the lock, and on the key are is the words room, and then the w- word N O, which is an old uh, acronym for number. So room number two three seven. And if there's only two words that you can come up with that have those letters in them, and that's moon and room. And I saw that I'm like, yeah. There's also the word moron. You fucking idiot. <laughs> Jesus. Like, you're, try- you're trying too fucking hard, man. You're too too hard. Like, <laughs> it's right, clear as day. You could also spell the word moron with this. It's not, it's not that deep. Moon and room, come on, man. Yeah, and you know, hey, doesn't also, the ending of this movie took place at night. You know what's out at night? Mm-hmm. Space. The moon. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're not no, wrong, it's, but. <sighs> it's, it's, this documentary is trying too hard. I don't think it's worth the little bits of interesting uh, information you get out of it to sit down and watch the whole thing. Um, like it's like the first half is points out some good stuff, but then the second half, when they talk about the moon and playing the movie frontwards and backwards, it's, it's all too much. Honestly, um, like um, it just kind of lost me. Cause again, I just, yeah. I just finished the movie and then I was like, all right, well I'll watch two, three, seven. And my goal of that was, I wasn't really going to pay attention too much. It was going to kind of be background. Then if I find interesting things, jot them down, uh, but the it's essentially this documentary is just different filmmakers or mm-hmm. critics and or whatever and their history with the movie and what they think it represents and why they it represents this and they explain it. Uh, they'll show you cuts from the movie it, it, explaining what they're trying to say. But when it got to the guy that like would talk like this. And then, and I'm just like, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. (laughs) And then you hear something. And honestly, I thought it sounded like a cat was outside my house, like my actual house. And now the guy was like, stopped. He's like, do you hear my kid? Hold on. Let me go see if I can. It's it's so, it seems so unprofessional. What the (laughs) fuck? And then you just got cuts of eyes wide (laughs) shut going around. And I'm like, what am I watching? Yeah. I, like I said, I don't recommend 237 at all. Like you, there's some interesting points that you can find in other sources of media for the shining that 237 is not worth the time it's it's got its head up its own ass for an hour and a half not i could just it. see somebody um, like I, I guess maybe the time i don't know when did it come out when did that it only came out a few years ago okay so yeah there's no excuse i feel like if someone wanted to get that together uh they could have easily did that in a youtube video dude there's such a cool documentary you can make about 
the shining and the conspiracy theories around it that isn't this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you could get like actual like actors and directors and cast and crew and interviews and stuff like that. And you, there was something I don't know why The Shining brings this out and cons- like in people all these conspiracy theories about it, but it's so specific that I feel like there is a cool documentary you can make about that. But it ain't this one. Well, I feel like not this one. I feel like it was just a popular thing to just because it's Stanley Kubrick, and when the rumor came out that oh he'll fake the moon landing, yeah. Uh, I think it's it'll be since that in itself is a conspiracy. I think it'll mm-hmm. be easy to go look at one of it, you know, his next famous piece of work, which was you know The Shining, and be like, oh he that that kid's wearing a a spaceship yeah. on a sweater, which I I feel like is it's a it makes sense in the context of the movie that he would have that little sweater. But also, B, it could just be Kubrick making a joke about that. I think that. it's like, just, it's not- yeah, I think it's, I bet he put that on Danny and he'd be like, yo, people are going to freak out. <laughs> <laughs> I would not put it past him. Yeah. Um, uh, let's talk real quick about the making The Shining documentary. Now, this is like a 15, 20 minute, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, documentary that Vivian Kubrick, who was, I think, like 18 or so during the making of The Shining, was on set, had a little camera and she was following around the cast and crew. Um, she gets little interviews from Jack Nicholson, uh, Shelley Duvall, Scatman, uh, Danny. And it's, it's interesting cause you do get a lot of insight from this documentary. It's a lot of cool behind the scenes stuff. Um, you get to see that basically they were r- changing the scripts, like writing new dialogue, like every day. In fact, it got to the point where Jack Nicholson said he didn't bother reading the changes that came through because they were just going to change again 15 minutes later. <laughs> so I'm not, when you mentioned that he wrote that one scene, I'm not surprised uh to find that out but it is interesting because like you get a lot a lot of insight uh to like insider stuff um there's the famous uh behind the scenes shot of jack nicholson getting ready for the door yeah uh like uh smashing scene and yeah, like you see he almost uh, hits the Duvall first AD. sitting smoking a cigarette hanging out yeah but then yeah. he like he's he's getting whole hyped himself up and he's like swinging the axe and he almost hits the first AD who like is visibly like scared that jack nicholson's really gonna hit him with the axe <laughs> it's pretty great um, but yeah, like I said, the, the interviews are, are very quick. They're only like a minute or two a piece, maybe. But like, it is interesting to see, like, you know, Jack Nicholson be this nice, kind, friendly guy on set that you would imagine him to be, and then go right into character as as Jack Torrance. It's pretty great. Um, you, like I said, we talked about earlier. You do get to see, um, you know, some of the uh, harsher moments between Kubrick and and Shelley Duvall. But I like that it's unfiltered like you get like the in the moments kind of stuff of like you know uh, kubrick's got like a big set to deal with and a very small crew like that's one thing i took away from this this documentary was like it's it's a very small crew that you know didn't have that big of a budget but you know it's it's, it's seeing him com- command everything like that and being so involved with departments that he yeah. doesn't necessarily need to be that hands-on about um one the big one was you know, one of my favorite shots of this movie is the worm's eye view of Jack Nicholson in the pantry when yes. he gets locked in there. I was going to mention that earlier, but again, we just kept getting pushed for time when he was, uh, yeah, yeah, when he was on the laying on the ground over Jack, yeah, on the pantry door. It was absolutely phenomenal. It, it's a brilliant shot, just from the floor looking straight up at Jack Nicholson. And in in the in the documentary, you see that happen in real time of Kubrick just walking around with his eyepiece. And yeah. he just lays on the floor. He goes, oh, yeah, that'll work. And I'm like, that's – it was a last minute, like, yeah, that's not bad. And I'm like, that's one of the best shots in cinema. Like, it's so fucking good. Yeah. And, and it, it was just on a whim. When I saw when I saw that clip, I was thinking to myself, well, yes, this is an amazing shot. How else would you have done it? And the only thing I can think of would be the reverse of Shelley Duvall when Jack's coming in and shows her, like, flushed up against the wall. Uh, she's on the yeah. left, the door's on the Which right. Wouldn't, it would have been a nice little symmetry there, but I no, love this not, shot no. so much better. See, but th- that's, to me, that's boring, and I felt, or it's not boring, but I felt like that angle was better used elsewhere, and I think he knew that. And he's like, I don't want to yeah. do it, like, I don't want to do it like this, because I'm saving that kind of shot for... For sure. Yeah. For sure. No, it, it it's a beautiful shot. I, I Like I said, this... It is a nice little documentary. It's, you know, it's crudely kind of cut together, very DIY, uh, like, you know, 
Vivian Kubrick kind of did this on her own. It's not even really a documentary so much as here's a little behind the scenes footage. Here's some other behind the scenes footage. It's all just kind of stitched together. But it is interesting if you're into The Shining. You can watch the full thing on uh, BBC on YouTube. Like they aired it uh, back in the day and it's it's available in full on YouTube. I literally just searched it as you were talking about it because I was like, where can I watch this? Because I don't think yeah, I – it's, it's in full on YouTube. It's great. Yeah, great. Awesome. Um, Dr. Sleep. Now, you haven't seen it. Nope. I don't want to spoil anything for you. Uh, we'll talk about it in generalities. Um, I haven't read the book either. And I should say, I've never read The Shining, the book, as well. Um, but I know Mally is a big fan. Um, he was a big fan of Dr. Sleep as well. Rip. Um, yeah, rest in peace, Mally. Um, but he didn't let me know that, like, the book is dog shit. And he's like, it's it doesn't read well, but – because it, it, it does something totally different. Like, do you know anything about the novel Dr. Sleep? Nope. I'm, like okay. I didn't even know there was a sequel until the trailers came out, and I was like, "Wait, right. really, really?" Okay, um, I'll give a very, very broad, basic explanation of what it is without spoiling anything. I um, do know. Let me tell you what I know about it. Okay, so far is a, okay. So Danny's grown up. Yep, and this is kind of coming from the trailer of the movie. So again, any listeners that hasn't seen it yet, neither. This is just from the trailer. From what I've gathered, Danny's grown up. Uh, mm-hmm. experiencing strange things. Uh, again, I'm assuming maybe they came back or something, some weird visions or whatever. He meets somebody who also has the shining. I think it was a that's little girl. Abra, the little girl. Yeah. Yep. That's Abra. And there's some gypsy type creature. Well, they look like yeah. gypsies and Re- humans. That's, uh, Rebecca Ferguson playing Rose the Hat is her name. Yeah. And they feed off the shining or feed off. So that's yeah. It's just they're they're in all in all broad terms like they're basically st- what they call steam. They refer to the shining as steam. Okay, and they are basically vampires, steam vampires yeah. essentially. And see what's it's funny very, is I walked in on Shay watching it, uh-huh. and the hat lady was again vaping, and I, I was and I was like, "What are you watching?" She said, "Doctor Slate." I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, I can't watch it now." Because it's like right in the middle of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to walk away. But I was yeah. like, what the hell is this smoke shit coming it's, out? It's very interesting in that it's in the same world. It is a direct sequel. And yet it's take, it looks at The Shining in a very different aspect. It looks at it more of a physical thing than like this, you know, supernatural metaphysical, you know, it's, it's not bad. I'll say this. It's different, but it's certainly not bad. And know. it's something that that's silly that that silly sounding of like oh we feed off the steam like it sounds dumb general like basically it sounds real dumb. Well, if something they like do a that, very good yeah, job of it. I was about to say if something as dumb as that, if you say it's that good, then I'm for it. I don't know how I like the the idea of I don't know. I kind of like the shining being a like a psychic like a I don't know. Well, here's what I'll say: if if it wasn't worthy of you seeing it. I would say just dismiss oh, it all well, together yeah, because I get what you're saying. Like one thing I like about The Shining is it's simplistic. It's very straightforward. Even if it is ambiguous, it's a simple story. Guy goes to the cabin with his family, tries to murder them. There's some ghost. Like that's pretty much it. Doctor Sleep takes that idea and just plays with it in a different kind of way. Like when you watch it, you'll feel Kubrick in a lot of the scenes. Okay, like. It's got his – It's obviously, nobody could really replicate Kubrick. I think the closest person that gets there is uh, Denis Villeneuve, the director of, like, uh, Sicario and Prisoners, uh, Blade Runner 2049. He gets pretty close okay. to the Kubrick yeah. style. But uh, Michael Flanagan do- does a phenomenal job with taking the seemingly impossible task of making a sequel to The Shining and, I think, does a stand-up fucking job. Uh, like, My- Michael Flanagan, he – where do I know him from? He did from? Gerald's Game on Netflix. And he – did Did he do the uh, Haunting series, the Blah House? And I, think, the, I think I think he did. I and, think you're right. Um, um, Hill House? I think you're right, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Uh, no, he's he's coming up, man. He's really great. And I'll say, you know, I, I don't think this is a spoiler either. There are other characters from The Shining that are recast – in Doctor Sleep, just because you know those, it's a forty-year-old movie now, and people oh, have passed I'm, away. Or I'm sorry, he did uh, Hush also on, which is a yes. great Netflix movie. Okay, I'll I'm say sorry. Go ahead. There is um, a recasting of Wendy 
just to keep her in, you know, Shelley Duvall is obviously too old now to play the character, but like right. she, the, the woman they get to play Wendy, I haven't really seen her in much, is so fucking good yeah. in the little screen time she has. Like, I swear to God, there's a part where she calls out for Danny, and I swear they just took Shelley Duvall's audio and dropped it in. Because, like, it sounds exactly like her. She she does so fucking good. And you get this in the trailer, too. Scatman Crothers, his character Dick Halloran is, is recast. But this guy is also, like, everybody is so fucking good at what they're doing. And what would feel like a fan film, it, like, it, it doesn't. Like, it just feels so cohesive and connective that, you know, it's it's hard when you have to recast or like, you know, your lead talent dies or whatever, you know, like that you can't get them back, but that man, they do a great fucking job. Um yeah, that that's what I will say. The only thing I'll really say about Doctor Sleep, it's definitely a fantastic movie. Uh is it The Shining's equal? It's hard to say. I'd probably say no, but that's only because it's doing something different in that world while still trying to like pay homage and be up to the up to the task and i think it does on those fronts it does a phenomenal job like it's it's definitely a sequel to the shining and it's definitely a good movie so like i highly highly recommend it for a horror movie that's a sequel to come out in today's uh, like yeah that that's very very rare that you're putting it on a higher standard like i don't know I don't know what it is about it's, this it's stage. Just horror's been hit or miss. Um, and I'll say, there is a brutal fucking scene in that movie. <laughs> I was about to say, I'm assuming with it being a newer movie, or again, a movie that came out in this generation, I'm, uh, as far as gore and blood and... <sighs> Not very gory, but like I said, there is a brutal fucking scene in that movie that... Is worth the price of admission alone. Oh, Jesus. Uh, so, <laughs> and it, it's definitely going to make some people uncomfortable if they haven't seen it. It's it's probably like midway through the movie. I guess but the biggest man. questions, like, okay, so, you know those things that, like, okay, so The Shining, like, the movie, uh, what made the power connection, like, The Shining, the ability now, what made it so, I don't know, unique in that movie was, like, of course, and I mentioned this earlier, is like you don't know how it works. Yeah. Uh you talked about how Scatman and his grandmother had it. Is it genetic, hereditary? Is it how like is it special? You know what I mean? Like um, is it unique to that one person? Uh well or is it's, it, it's hard to Yeah, to how rare say. is it? But you know, like it's, and, and it's, again at Doctor Sleep. Rare. If, yeah. It's definitely rare, but I don't I don't remember if they ever I don't think they ever really say like it's you know, it's not like a midichlorian yeah, thing. Yeah, it's know? not like a one in six people have it. Yeah, no, it's nothing. I know nothing like that. But when you think about it, if Scatman, it, I mean, of course, we don't know this. If his grandmother was the only person he knew that had it until he met Danny as an well, old I don't man. Know if, he, if he was the if that was the only person he knew that had it, that's just the one that he t- talks about. Yeah, he and very well could have the, known other people. Yeah, and again, I would I want to see that movie. I want to see a Scatman I wouldn't mind seeing a young Scatman. Yeah. Yeah. Done right. That'd be great. I think it'd be great. Maybe that's what they're doing with Overlook. I don't know. With the HBO series. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, and again, the only thing I can think of is some kind of, I don't know, civil rights. Like, uh, I don't know. It, it could be great. It could be done really well. Yeah. Um, I will say, too, the visuals of Dr. Sleep are, mwah. like, it's it's not... On the level of The Shining in terms of, like, the simplicity of it. But they do a lot with a little with the visuals of that movie. Um, visually, it's stunning. Like, it's it's great. And, see, um, and again, like, supernatural movies that's came out here in this generation, I, I've kind of gotten... Because they just, they just pump those guys out. Like, uh, uh, I don't know. I'm just thinking, like, there's a movie about a Ouija board. There's a movie about yeah. a cursed mirror. There's a movie about... Uh, now let's take, I'm going to take the insidious stuff aside because they're good for their own reasons, but Dr. Sleep. Yeah. I found out it was a sequel to the shining. Yes. Ewan McGregor's attached to it. And then mm-hmm. the girl or the lady from the greatest showman that sings. I didn't, I didn't know her name at that point, but Rebecca Ferguson, I, yes. I know from mission impossible. Yeah. So I, it just, yeah. Even with all that aside, 
it still kind of went under my radar just because of the whole, like, I don't know. It's, I guess maybe the timing. It just didn't catch yeah. my eye. But, uh, well, I mean, it's 40 years later, too. Like, it's, yeah. it's a big undertaking. And, no, and it is know, time. If you're going to either leave it alone or either do it now yeah. or leave it alone forever. Yeah. You know? And, I mean, Stephen King, you know, he said it was cathartic for him because he's involved with it heavily. Um, in that, you know, Kubrick took a lot of deviations from his book. Um, and this Dr. Sleep, you know, he found a way to tie Kubrick's movie in and his book in into one and have like a, a solid ending that respected both the book, respected both the movie and um, left and it at that. So if it could be brought back for a sequel, you could, but if you left it alone, it would have been just fine. Yeah, no, it it's, it's like I said, it, I, I'm glad Stephen King finally got to have his closure on it. Cause I know he went back and forth with hating it and loving it and hating Kubrick and loving him. But this, it seems now like he's, he's got it under his belt. Like he, he's happy with the end results and like i said it's it's a it's just a good movie on its own like i that's how i yeah. see it it's great shiny sequel great movie definitely worth your time um one thing uh yeah. and when you talked about how stephen king's uh heavily involved with the doctor sleep stuff it made me pop up the question like imagine if stanley kubrick did a doctor sleep sequel but then, of course, yeah. yeah. But also, and I had I wrote this question down earlier, and I want to I want your uh, quick answer. If I guess curiosity, just for you, mm -hmm. if Stanley Stanley Kubrick was, let's say, I don't know, whatever, he comes back from the dead, and he's like, I could direct one movie from a franchise. Holy shit! <laughs> one movie from a franchise, and I'm going back to hell. Uh, what would I want to see him do? A shiny what would you want to have a dress him? Well, no, not a shot, not necessarily a shining sequel, a, a franchise. Oh, anything like not like it doesn't have to be a movie. Maybe I don't know, like a graphic novel, mm. comic book. Okay, uh, I think I would like to see Kubrick do a season of True Detective. Oh, like shit. that's the first thing I thought about when you said it. Like, you know, I would, that that'd be really interesting to see him do see what he would do in that because world. Because I said movie. And well, you said it could be a graphic novel. You didn't. Well, no, I'm you, saying if you want me source, to do a movie. No, I'm saying oh, a okay, source. I see what you're saying. I was saying gotcha, you're cheating okay, okay. because a movie's two and a half um, hours. Uh, you're getting a whole series out of this guy. But no, that's a good answer. That's a really good answer. Well, here's what I'll say: If you want to pick movie, this is for this is hard. The, the first thing I'm thinking of would be another sequel to Blade Runner, and that's the first thing I thought. Of. I, I I love what he does with sci-fi, and I think. You know, Denis Villeneuve was pretty much spot on what I would imagine a Kubrick yes. Blade Runner movie to look like. I would want to see so. like uh, something like Dune, the trailer to Dune. That yeah, yeah, okay. So that's Kubrick vibes to me, just from the imagery, not necessarily the acting dialogue, just from the shots that they decided to show us. Yeah, I was heavily intrigued and I heavily got those vibes. Well, like um, I said, man, like Denis Villeneuve is the modern day Kubrick. Like, yeah, he's fucking incredible. Every movie he does is a fucking barn burner. Like, Arrival is a great sci fi movie. Sicario is a great like drug running crime thriller. Right. Prisoners is my ultimate favorite from him. It's great. I just watched Prisoners again recently, and I forgot it how good it was. Fucking rules, and like everything he does is great. Enemy of past episode is is fucking. It's basically his eyes wide shut. So, yeah, like, okay, so we're we're <laughs> branching here, but I haven't listened to that episode yet because I haven't mm -hmm. watched it yet. But mm -hmm. and a, the plot hasn't been ended, but uh or spoiled for me, sorry. But the ending has been. Yep. And yep. it's snuck up and okay, so here's the thing. I don't like spiders. All right. Now, <laughs> <laughs> look, the only Spoiler reason for the ending of it, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, here's the thing. You put me in an empty room with a spider. I'm a freak out because I don't know where it's at. Yeah. All right. If you put me in a room with a snake. With a room sized spider. <laughs> oh, sh yeah, exactly. But uh, if you put me in a room with like a snake or something. Yeah, I can see it. I can stay away from it. All right. We're good. Okay. That's what freaks me out about spiders. Okay. Even the big. Like, okay, the big ones aren't so bad. Like, tarantula's, like, cool. Yeah, I'm not going to fuck with it, but I can see it. If I can see it, I'm not scared of it. Yeah. This motherfucker, like, it came out of fucking nowhere, and I think that's why it terrified the fuck. It just shows him. Yeah. I don't want to spoil that for anybody else. Like like I said, it's basically him doing Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah. 
It it pretty much is that. But and him and Jake Gyllenhaal can keep doing their thing if they want they're to. They're doing um, a, a TV series for HBO coming up soon called but The Sun. I, I don't know anything like, about it though. If if Stanley Kubrick came back from the dead, he's like, I came back for one movie, and for some reason, JT, you are the chosen one to choose what kind of movie is going to be. Mm-hmm. I would want to see him do something that I, he's never really like. You know, he's done space. Okay, he's done horror, and well. Okay, yeah, he did the hotel, like, the isolation thing. I would like to see something on the lines of, say, The Witch, or, um... Like a period piece, or you just mean something like super, some, yeah, like so, that? Yeah, uh, not necessarily period piece, because he had... Just something along the vibe of, uh, again, small cast. Uh, so maybe something like The Lighthouse? Okay, yes, Lighthouse, uh, something like... Uh, Hereditary, uh, The Witch, uh, along okay. that lines of suspense horror by the way we're talking about exactly two different directors <laughs> like the movies we've mentioned so far are only between Ari Aster and um fuck what's the guy's name from the witch in the lighthouse i can't remember but anyway <laughs> uh but yeah yeah that's uh no that's i feel like i i would that would be great i think that would be really great and i feel like um, witch is i feel like there's not enough witch movies the witch is there's the not best enough witch. good witch movies the witch is the best witch movie we have um mm. Yeah, and then you got like yeah. the the classic the witches or witches of Eastwick, whatever. Yeah, didn't Which see also it. I think Jack Nicholson played in a witch movie. Yeah, I think he's in that too. Yeah. Um, all right, let's let's talk about the Shining miniseries. Now, have you ever seen it? A long, long time ago. Okay, so long you, you probably don't remember much about it, right? I remember what the dad who the dad looks like, what the kid looks like. Yeah, I remember that Jack used a giant croquet mallet instead of a yeah axe which far was... less intimidating <laughs> yeah um yeah i had avoided seeing this thing uh as long as i could until this episode and i was like if i'm gonna do the shining episode i have to do it justice i have to see the mining series i didn't uh I said, <laughs> <that."> well <laughs> um i am here to say that if you've never seen it you can skip it it it's so i don't know this is definitely way worse than the It miniseries that they did in the 90s. It's so bad, man. Yeah, and the It miniseries, like, for as bad as it is now, it is still loved by It's charming. Millions. Yes. It's it's charming. This is not. This is real bad. <laughs> um, Just some of the takeaways from it. Uh, I didn't know Elliot Gould was in it. He he plays Omen in this. And he's he, he's so aggressive. At the beginning of this movie. And I get why he is, but man, I've never seen Elliot Gould play angry, really. And that was an interesting take on it. Um, the guy playing Dick Halloran. May, you know what? It may be worth seeing just to see this guy. I don't know his name, but he is basically a pimp. Oh. Like, he is suave as shit. He's got the cane. He's got the convertible. Like, he is... he. Fucking, you put a, a a hat on him with a feather in it. He's a pimp. Like I'm convinced. Um, he's he's actually like the standout of the movie, and he's not even really in it that much. Um, we talked about it a little bit when we talked about The Shining, but I think the hotel does not look good at all. It looks yeah like a cheap bed and breakfast. Like it has nowhere the like gravitas and like huge overwhelming foreboding of the overlooking. The Shining, it, the movie, it, and so. it looks like it was filmed in the summer. Like it just seems, yeah. It's just, it's not scary either. Like the movie is not scary. Bright, it, it very. And very. when I say that, like, and even in the 1980, there's bright scenes. It, it doesn't have that to, you still know, but, are haunting. But when you talk, like, we're we're talking about the location, like, it's just. It looks like a very nice day outside. The hotel is completely white and luxurious, and yeah, it looks well, like the thing too about like it looks like I don't have a high enough credit score to get in, but <laughs> for it does look like a country yeah, club. So I'm reading a but, review that someone posted two months ago about the TV miniseries. Yeah, and someone said this is pretty much the forgotten bootleg cousin of the 1980s masterpiece. <laughs> it's, two months ago, it, the fact yeah. that people are still reviewing, I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, The Shining is back in the in the conversation with Doctor Sleep and the Overlook TV series coming out. It's back, like. And it's it's never really left. Like, it's been a staple of pop culture, but people oh, yeah, are really sure. starting to rediscover it now. Um, but yeah, what I was going to say, though, about the day shots in the movie, 
uh, the, the 1980 movie, it's even though it's bright and sunny out, like when you know we see the first shot of Jack having that infamous Kubrick thousand yard stare, and he's just staring. Like it's brightly lit, but it's still haunting and dark. Mm-hmm. Like the miniseries doesn't do that. Everything is quick paced. Because it's cut for television, I get it, and it's also yeah the style of the time. But man, is it a drop in quality! Um, the fact that Tony is portrayed by an actual physical embodiment is hilarious because it's this guy that floats and he's got like a bad haircut and glasses. It's so fucking funny the first time you see him, dude. I I lost it. I was it was so goddamn funny. Okay, well, all right. Uh, real just, quick, just look so, up Tony. Just wait, look up Tony real quick. Real quick, <laughs> I uh, I went to IMBD. Right, uh-huh. I need you to go to IMBD. I need you to type in The Shining, and of course, go to the TV series. Yeah, I need you to look at the picture that I don't know who chose it for him. Uh, Cortland Mead, the guy that played the kid that played Danny. Yeah, <laughs> this his IMDb photos picture. after talking about. Yes, I need you to look at. Oh, that. I know. I've seen it. I've Dear seen this photo. God. <laughs> That poor kid. Um, oh, bless his heart. I don't he know what, what's so, he doing. He, he's aha uh-huh in The Little Rascals. Yeah, I, I remember that. He's but just he's, in recess. He's, he hasn't done anything since 2010. Uh, obviously. Um, no, that poor kid. He looks so stupid in this the miniseries because they gave him a bowl cut. Stupid and not even an even bowl, bowl cut. cut. Like, that kid should have already had braces like three years ago. He's in, he's, well, I don't know if it's – I don't think it, it's like a physical thing like, like – uh, like Joaquin Phoenix has or anything, but he's incapable of closing his mouth. Yeah, it's like throughout the it's, whole movie, so he just walks around teeth first, like, like. with these chipmunk <laughs> cheeks, and you know, bless his heart. Like, yeah. And the thing is, the kid, as far as his acting goes, he seemed innocent enough to where, like, you know, it, I guess I can understand why they chose him to be cat. Like, you know, it's the innocence, but uh, I don't know. He seemed to do okay but it's his yeah. voice it's it like he has a speech impediment or not really a speech impediment it just seemed too proper and it's it, well everyone's really annoying in this miniseries like no one i don't you don't feel for anyone yeah so it's it's hard to latch on and feel for anyone when actual real shit starts going on but yeah tony just floating in the air is so goddamn funny Wait, that's that's <laughs> what this is him. He's like, I thought he you were about to hit play. I thought you look, I thought you were about to hit play on that. I thought it was a clip and it's going to cut. Oh, I can to, find a clip. No, 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 no. You don't need to. <laughs> Cause I thought it was going to cut to the quote unquote Tony, but no, that's, that's just him standing there. He he just floats in the air and he bobs back and forth but because problem, he's on wires. Yeah. But the problem is he just looks like a normal guy. I yeah. figured Tony would, I don't know. Well, it, he too, he, he ends up playing the older version of Tony doc of danny oh wait and- actually okay the cut where the uh old come back up that that lady there in the bathtub yeah i do remember that as a kid and i do remember that scaring me for the age that i was at yeah no nah, i mean i don't know man I, but I'm, anything you know, practical to me like a good practical practical effects over cgi any day yeah god that haircut's so stupid so bad um no the main series is awful it it feel it, it's you know, it's probably rated R, but it feels PG f- throughout the first, like, three hours of the thing. It's actually not um, rated. Oh, well, that, okay. But the problem is, the biggest problem is, not only is it absolutely awful, but it's four hours and 33 minutes long. Yeah, I had to split it up. It, I couldn't do the whole thing at once. See, it was the, real I guess, Okay, so rough. let's take this on another look and be like, okay, why would you want to watch this? It mm-hmm. is true to the book, and with it being four and a half hours, that means... Hey, if you wanted to know a little bit more backstory about the sh- like a little bit more filler, yeah, about the shining the book without reading the book, yeah, sure, watch it. Like some stuff that is very predominant in the book is actually in this. It's not done well, but it's there. Yeah, well, uh, everything falls apart too. Like the acting and the direction are all terrible. Um, this guy that plays Jack Torrance is not great, um, and. Oh, boy, there is a hilarious little bit of trivia about this guy. I'm trying to find it now on his IMDb. Oh, yeah, here it is. In 2011, he he was in a project called Being Bin Laden. Do you want to take a guess at what character he played? George Bush. <laughs> nope. This guy straight up played Osama Bin Laden in a project in 2011. <laughs> Look it up, people. 
It's great. Um, no, it's. I don't care how close it is to the book. It's fucking terrible. Oh no, it it's is not. It's not worth it. Even like when shit fu- does start, like start finally happening, and he does start going crazy. Not worth it. Like I'm not the biggest book person, okay? But if I was forced to watch that to get my shining lore fix, it'll make me pick up the book. Like you know, Maybe. like it'll just like you know what? Let's just yeah. Um. There are two little things that I do want to point out about the Shining miniseries that I thought were pretty great. Um, you know this dude's a psychopath right away, though, in uh, the Shining miniseries, the guy playing Jack, because he's chewing aspirin without a drink. Uh, he just dry – he dry takes the pills throughout the movie a lot, and it, it's horrific. He's, he's That's the scariest them? part. He's chewing them. And he keeps a bottle of aspirin, like, in his inner coat pocket. <laughs> like a um, – like um, Mar from Sin City, or is that his name? I think yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> Where yeah. he just like takes pills and just yeah. But see, he's a badass, <laughs> and this guy, this guy's not. This guy's a fucking square. This guy played Bin Laden, and this guy played Bin Laden. Yeah. Um, and another thing in the movie, they keep going to the grocery store to get groceries, but they have a full pantry of food. Like I don't know why, but they keep leaving the overlook, and they come back with bags of like paper bags of groceries, and I didn't understand. I'm like. They go over they, – they do the same thing they did in the movie. They go over and, they, and Dick Halloran shows them all the groceries there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I thought that was right. And funny enough, Stephen King was heavily involved with this one and they straight up rip lines directly out of the Shining movie, like the 1980 one. In, it, I don't know. It's very strange, the the love-hate he had for Kubrick's version. I, I don't know. What, what – um, when did uh, the It TV series come out? Like what, what year? I think 1990, like – Exactly, 1990. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, 1990. Okay, yeah. Okay, well, never mind. Because I was thinking, like, if the It TV series had such a big, yeah, this hype, came out seven years later. Yeah, maybe they're all like, all right, do it. I wonder In how 97. Long pro- I mean, I wonder how long production time was on on a four hour movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, The Matrix comes out two years later. Like, look at how different the film the filming just changed. So drastically, well, like also the Matrix wasn't <sighs> made for TV. No, but like you just, I, I'm just talking about in comparisons of like the time of like it's only a two year difference and like what you could do. Like Jurassic Park comes out the year before this, <laughs> and like, like yeah. think of how well you can make stuff. You I could mean, it, The Shining, you, it's yeah, it's 17 years before then, and they just. I don't know if it's a budget thing, if it was a director, or because King was probably still coked out of his mind. But I think okay, so I think you're right about that last one, but also King and Kubrick were still like buttonheads, like oh, well, I think my- Kubrick's dead at this point, if I'm not mistaken. Well, he can I still, think they can still butt heads. It doesn't matter. <laughs> King's still pissed off that like that Kubrick's version. Oh, no, Kubrick does in 99. My mistake. Did so fucking well. He's like, you know what? Someone approached Stephen King. Well, hey, let's do it your way. We'll make it four and a half hours long. Uh, yeah. It's made for TV, but here's a bunch of money. Yeah. And, yeah. And so he may have been like, all right, now I'm going to show you what Shining was really supposed to be like. Kubrick's an asshole, blah, blah, blah. And then shut this thing out. Can I? This is something I've toyed around this is something I've toyed around with for a while, but, um, you know, we're in this kind of Stephen King renaissance now. Like, he's, he's like, his source material is getting a lot of attention again. It, and uh, now we're doing the Overlook TV series, and there's Castle Rock and all these other things. It's, The Shining seemed, used to be, like, sacred ground. Like, no one touched The Shining. Mm-hmm. And now that Dr. Sleep is out, and it's, you know, it wasn't a box office smash. It was it technically, like, bombed. But... It's a great fucking movie. Yeah, as long as it um, critic, as long as it did well, like, as long as, I yeah. think, I think we can get to a point now where we can re remake The Shining or at least reimagine it. You know what I mean? I think we can get there. Can I? Can I pitch you my remake of The Shining? We would need a team of directors. No, I got, <laughs> I got you. Your director. Let me pitch you my remake idea. Okay. Yeah. We get. The, the modern day Kubrick, we get Denis Villeneuve to direct it, okay? Mm-hmm. So this is the guy behind Prisoners, Sicario, Rival, all that stuff. All right. Uh, we make it we make it about Grady when he was there as the caretaker, right? Okay. I like that idea because 
we've already talked about different people who would almost play Jack Torrance. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I can try to find somebody now to play. I got your guy. And it's obvious. It's an obvious choice. I'm not like saying like I'm I'm genius for thinking of this. Uh, Brian Cranston. Mm. You can see Brian, Brian. Look at Malcolm Mendel. Look at you know Breaking Bad. He can do the smile. You know, of upbeat, happy guy. You can see him go crazy. Yeah. You know, I look at that ending of the Crawl Space episode of Breaking Bad where he has that maniacal laugh. Uh huh. That's your Jack Torrance man, yeah. or your Dale Grady in this case. Okay. His wife. I'm kind of in the toss up. I'm I I'm thinking Julianne Moore. Um see, I was thinking um and I'm sorry I'm not quick on the draw with uh with names. That's fine. Yeah. It, are you thinking about a specific person? Uh the first thing I thought about was uh Tony Collette. But yes. But but yes. I like your choice because we all know she can, like, Tony Collette can act in that, like, if they uh, reenact st- the stair scene, scene, sorry. The stair yeah, scene. Yeah, I want to see Julianne Moore do horror, but, man. Again, Julianne Moore yeah. has the more, like, <laughs> now, nothing against Tony Collette fans. She is one of the greatest actor- actresses of our generation. Mm-hmm. But as far as the motherly figure, mm-hmm. I think softer features with uh, your choice would be absolutely great. Plus, I can see her in that bathroom, like how Shelley Duvall is, freaking out. I can see Julianne Moore doing it. Tony Collette, I know, can do it. I want to see someone who I th- who I can feel can do it, but I haven't seen do it. You know what I mean? Um, For the daughters, for, for the, the Grady sisters, you can just get unknowns. Yeah. For, I mean, because they're going to be young anyways. Now, here's where things get interesting. Lloyd, the bartender. He's got to be younger, right? Hold on. Michael Fox. Okay. Oh, wait, what? Michael what? Michael, Michael Fosbender. Fosbender? Yeah. I can see that through his... Uh, or Anthony Starr from uh, Homelander from The Boys. Uh, Yeah, I guess. I like uh, Michael Fosbender. I can, I can okay. get... Uh, gosh, what was his name in uh, Prometheus? Oh, uh, Logan Marshall Green? No, 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 no. What was uh, um, Michael Fosbender's character's name? Oh, oh, uh, um, uh, fuck, David. David, shit. David. Okay, yeah. I get David vibes from Lloyd. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, I can That's see exactly that. exactly why I picked him. I was like, he, I, I can, he, he can do that, you know, robotic almost kind of feel to him. So right. that's why I was speaking for Lloyd. Now, for Dick Halloran, I have a toss-up between two. If you want to go with a more kind of serious kind of take on him, do Mahershala Ali. Right, okay. Now, if you want to do someone who's kind of more up and coming that I think is – phenomenal and also can be that kind of gentle you know approach to him but also can have those kind of serious moments um you get yaya abdul mateen the second who a lot of people know as uh plays a very specific very important character in the watchman tv series that i don't want to really spoil too much all right you're gonna spell that name for me okay actually okay, you know so what watchman yeah watchman his name is yaya y-a-h-y-a yep, i got you uh, i got you he, he's gonna yeah. be candy man okay he's gonna be in the new candy man movies he's great i think he could also play a good I young was dick for, for uh dick Halloran, um um uh, winston winston duke from uh us and black Panther. winston duke could be good uh just a different you know different style of dog sure but I think you make it a direct prequel to Kubrick's version because I wanted to see that same hotel. And the thing is, we know how it's going to end. So, like, you get you get kind of a different – it's you get the what-if ending of The Shining, the movie, right? Where Wendy and and uh, Jack, uh, D- Danny escape. And this one, we know no one does. But that's not the definitive end of your movie. Then you get the ghost version of – uh grady and everything like that you know what i mean you get to see the hauntings okay, real- wait hold on you lost me all right so <laughs> in your movie uh-huh. we just casted it and it's a direct sequel well prequel direct prequel to prequel. kubrick's okay. version sorry i thought you said sequel mm-hmm. yeah um yeah i like it right 
I mean, it's kind of the people you would expect, but I want to see that fucking movie. Like yeah. that. If if you gave me, you know, 40, 50 million dollars right now and said make a movie, that's what I'm doing with it. I'm making a direct prequel. Denny Villeneuve is my director. If he wants to do it. If not, I might go with someone a little more controversial. I'm going to go with like a Nicholas Winding Refn. Like uh, Only God Forgives, Drive, uh, you know, Neon Demon. Okay. Because he could, he could definitely have the visual flair. Or I go with somebody who I know is more confident in like their direction and stuff like that. I go with like a Kerry Fukunaga. Like a, a Beast of No Nation. He's doing No Time to Die, the new James Bond movie. He's fucking amazing. Uh, he did all of season one of True Detective. So, you know, I, I, I feel like, like I said, The Shining used to be sacred ground. No one touched it. And now we're kind of dipping our toes back into if, it. So if you were doing the direct prequel, um, and just because different timelines and different characters are going to interact with each other, uh, and I don't know why, I'd, again, I don't know directors and stuff like you guys do, uh, the director of Place Beyond the Pines. Oh, Derek C. in France. Yeah. That'd be a very ethereal movie. <laughs> yeah, because I was just thinking, I was like, who has these long, like, boating shots? Like, I'm just well, you know, Jordan going Pilkin maybe do a good job, too. God, you're right. Uh, yeah. when, I, when I thought of us, it made me think of that. Yeah. Uh, which actually I thought of Jordan Pill earlier when we talked about, like, Stanley Kubrick, like, doing things to do subliminal messages and stuff. And odds are he probably just didn't. But he's yeah. whatever. I was watching an interview with uh, Jordan Peele and people were giving theories about us and stuff like that. Where the girl is like eating cereal separate from milk. Oh, and that's from like, Get Out, yeah. Oh, Get Out, sorry. And they were talking yeah, about... She, yeah. <laughs> people and were he, like... He denies that, but I'm like, man, I don't know. <laughs> no, he, but there was, there was a, there's a couple of them. He's like, yes, that's exactly what I meant to do. Like yeah. he's obviously joking, but he's like, yeah, yeah, sure. No, that that whole Fruit Loops separated from the white milk theory is great, but I love that he's like, nah, it's just a weird way white people would eat cereal. That is a that is a way I feel like white people would eat cereal. I am an funny. avid cereal fan. I'm a connoisseur. Also I mean, falls in line with my theory that psychos drink milk by yeah. itself. So yeah, I'm raising a psychopath. <sighs> um. All right, man. That's I, I. I'm kind of all spent on talking about shining and shining related stuff. Is there anything we didn't talk about that you would feel remiss if we didn't? Um, it doesn't have to be about the movie. Anything Jesus. shining or Kubrick related? Um, I know there's so much we didn't get into, and I'm sorry yeah. to the listener, but we're already th- you know well over three hours. <laughs> yeah, I think the last thing was you know um my 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 question was if. Kubrick came back and that there was a franchise and when I meant by like a franchise it doesn't have to be a sequel from an existing movie in a franchise but like if yeah. there was a comic book series that you like or whatever I, that's hard because I, I I'm trying to I'm trying to imagine Kubrick and comic books together and it's well it's I know tough. that I'm, I'm just saying <laughs> I use that as an example see my mind immediately goes to Kubrick as a as a horror like just because of the shining uh don't kick me from this podcast when I say this uh, I have not seen 2001: A Space Odyssey. Man, you got to get on it. It's and I, I know, it's, I know, it's so good. I've seen just clips and stuff when we look at top ten list. I, I I live on YouTube. We look at top ten lists and stuff like that. Just I don't know what these images that I'm looking are, are I'm looking at, but they're gorgeous. Yeah, and I know it's Kubrick, and yeah. Um, it's I'll tell you this: if you've never seen 2001, uh. The first time you see it, you do have to do a little bit of work. Like, it is a demanding movie because, like, the opening scene is, like, 15, 20 minutes with no dialogue. Like, it, right. it is a demanding movie, but it is well worth your investment in time. Like, it's it's an experience. I'll say that. It's not even, like, a movie. It's an experience. <laughs> but be, uh, That would be, like, that would be something you do. It's like, you make your movie. It's like, yeah, the opening, like, I'm not going to have any dialogue for 20 minutes. And then the first line of dialogue might be something like, uh, uh, I don't know. The main character walks into the store and is like, uh, he farts. Uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> no, the, maybe the customer's like yelling at the, uh, cashier saying, fuck you mean it was a dollar 97. So now you can say the f- first word in your movie is yeah. fuck after 20 <laughs> minutes of silence and absolutely yeah. nothing. No, I, here's the thing. I think, 
The Shining is my favorite movie of all time. I think 2001 is the best movie of all time. Oh. Like, it's a bold statement, but I think 2001 is... It envelopes everything inward. Like, it's... It, it's a... a like I said, it's an experience, man. It's not even like a movie. It kind of defies being a what movie. A movie is. It's like what you're yeah, looking for. It, when you're making a movie. It's the and it's like in the '60s, and it's redef- like cinema is still a fairly new thing, and it's like I, redefining I, it. I revisited that fact today, and I was like, because again, I, I, yeah, I've never seen it, but I know it's amazing. I didn't. It didn't hit with me. Like, yo, this fucking movie was made in the '60s. Yeah, the fucking '60s. Like what, My Fair Lady? Like, and Doctor Doolittle was like the only. Like we movies. just got out. We just got color. Like Go. last week. Like, and this <laughs> this motherfucker came out fucking swinging. And that was like one of his first feature length movies. And he was just he was just he's like, yo, I've been wanting to make this movie for years, but I just don't want this shit in black and white. I think I'm just going to sit on it. Like, <laughs> and then it came. Well, and out. then you watch it and like the visuals, yeah. like how they did some of the special effects and like you know the light sequence that everyone knows about it. It's it's amazing. Like it's it's truly like it defies definition. Like there's no way to describe 2001. It's it's yeah, a for, whole experience. Yeah. If you're uh, uh, sensitive to flashing lights, please don't watch it. They're not. It's not even that bad. I'll I tell you know, that. Man, like, it, I've seen that scene before, and I'm just like <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, no, I I truly think it's like if you if you made me pick like the best movie to represent like film, like it would probably be two thousand one. Next to the room, oh, okay, absolutely. <laughs> That's for Nathan. We got to bring it up when we can. Two thousand one might be a future episode, actually, on the show. It might be on on a future episode. Two thousand one. Anyway, I'm actually I'm looking might. at my brother's uh movie list right now, and I'm going to take it and just. Text him and tell him I got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. See 2001. See Dr. Sleep. Like, all right. Well, we're, that's a that's a good weekend, like, double feature. I'm off the next two days doing nothing. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'd love to talk about 2001 with you when you see it. It's, oh, it's, God. It's, it's great, man. Um, all right. Let's, let's delay no longer. Let's get into Silver Lining. Do you want me to go first while you're still thinking of it? Um. Or do you have one? Go ahead and go first. All right. <clears throat> oh, wait. No, I got one. I don't want you to take it because it took me this long to get it. Okay. Okay. So because I haven't seen Dr. Sleep, I'm not going to say Danny. Okay. All right. I, I, I don't know what happens. I mean, he may have a- sh- Well, just, you can speculate then. I mean, yeah, okay. just he- assume, assume, assume The Shining is, is, is a standalone. As a standalone. What do you have? <sighs> yeah. I honestly, perp- honestly, I want to give it to Wendy. Um, yeah, it's sad that she lost her husband, but at the same time, if, if it was as toxic as the shadows are showing that it could have been, yeah, she like, again, she's a wife. Yes. But she's also a mother the whole time in this movie. She's been trying to get her son. Well, most part of the movie, she's trying to get her son out and get him seen about and get him away from all this. And she succeeded in. Yeah, she survives. She like, that's survives. Yeah, the ultimate silver lining. From, yeah, that's again. She's completely helpless. She was completely terrified of Jack and everything that was going on, especially in the last fifteen minutes. The fact she got out, she survived. Yeah, I'm gonna give it to her. Yeah, um, my silver lining uh, does relate to Doctor Sleep. So it, for those who, it's not even really a spoiler. Um, but, you know, if you don't want to know anything about Dr. Sleep, then maybe skip ahead like 30 seconds. And JT, this isn't really going to be a spoiler for yeah, you don't either. Worry about it. I'm here for um, it. If, if Danny and Wendy don't survive at the end of this movie, Abra and Dr. Sleep is completely defenseless pretty much during the events of that movie. And it's because Danny plays a significant role in that movie. So, you know, much more death and destruction could have came from what happens in in the events of Dr. Sleep if Danny doesn't survive. And, you know, Wendy and Danny getting out of here saves Danny's good nature. It prevents him from also being taken by the hotel. You know what I mean? Like, he could also end up like those those Grady sisters, and that, that wouldn't have been good for anybody. <laughs> so, yes, 
Jack is dead, but Wendy and Danny survive, and that's the ultimate like silver lining. Man, that you can't get any better than that. Yeah, I mean, because when you look at every character that makes a difference, like it, that mean anything. Uh, what? There's four. I mean, there's four main actors. Yeah, four main characters. Okay, in this movie. okay with silver lining, the hotel manager didn't have to clean up anything. Uh, after, like, I don't know. Like, there's there's not much to work with. Uh, yeah. They're, they're, uh, now I'm just thinking about Omen finding dead Dick Halloran. That's sad as shit. Oh yeah. Because he liked Dick a lot. Yeah, he did. Damn. Rest in peace, Scatman Crothers and Dick Halloran. You just said, the you just said he liked Dick a lot. <laughs> I did say he liked Dick. Wow, way to rule it, ruin my tiny eulogy Sorry, for that man. man. We're, we're adults. <laughs> Last but not least, and I, we, there's no other answer I expect from you than duh, but do you recommend this movie? Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. Well, um, which, okay, we talked about a lot of movies. Uh, the Shining, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, The Room. Yeah, and The Room. And 2001, and Doctor Sleep, and all the other movies we talked and about. And Place Beyond the Pines, Hereditary. Sicario, Arrival. Uh, Blade Runner. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know about Blade Runner. The sequel, yes. Well, that's what I meant. I'm still, you, the one I'm you, still the, on the fence the, about the original. I don't... And look, I feel like you need to watch it to it, appreciate the sequel in, in me. Yeah. It was fine. <laughs> yeah. It, it was just... I saw it too late. That's the problem. I saw it too late. There you go. All right. Um. Yeah. I Like I said, I think this is one of the best movies ever made. Uh. And I don't even think that's a, sub- a subjective notion anymore. Like, I think this is definitive filmmaking it's firing on all cylinders like i said nothing is out of place everything is exactly what it needs to be visually audibly ethereally like it's it's perfect like this movie is perfect this is like film school 101 stuff like you learn the rules then you watch this movie and you watch it break most of those rules and it's there's it's a reason this movie hasn't really been remade or touched until 40 years later, we're only dipping our toes into it. You know what I mean? Like, it is actually uh, protected by a legislative of, um, I can't remember what the exact, y'all can, I uh, didn't know. Yes. Uh, quick thing, uh, keep talking for just a second so there's no quiet. All right. but I was watching a no. video earlier, and that's exactly what he was saying. Um, I would not be surprised by that. That there's like some kind of protection of like re like the rights to this movie or like like I don't know I mean I know Coop, uh, Stephen King will give his rights out to damn near anybody for like a dollar so I can't I'm sure there's all kinds of rights wrapped up in this thing that's that's a nightmare to to deal through deal with legislatively <laughs> um no yeah, like I said I think it's it's bar none one of the best movies ever made and one of the best horror movies ever made like as simple as it is it's a very simple movie um in terms of the story and everything, but it does so much with so little and it's, there's no, there's nothing else like it. Like every, people have tried doing the man in the isolated that goes crazy and they don't, they don't have Kubrick's touch. They don't have his, his Midas touch. I, I couldn't find it, but uh, yeah, someone, y'all can look it up. So yeah, you'll know what I'm talking That's about. Fine. It is protected by some kind of, uh, um, uh, for literature or film or something like that, it's some kind of organization. It's yeah, so it has to get right. it has to be on some kind of standpoint for it to get that kind of recognition. All right. Well, JT, uh, I'm all talked out of The Shining, or at least I'm talked out for this episode. Like I, yeah. I could talk about this all day, every day. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for uh, filling in for Mally. I, I know Mally really wanted to do this one with me. Um, yeah, man. But I'm glad that at last minute you were able to not only join in on the episode, but do all the extra work of watching the movie and watching the part of the 237. Um, I, I think you did a bang up job as a filler for Mally. So I appreciate thank you, first that. Of all yeah, for that. I mean, I, yeah, absolutely. Um, look, I know this is it's an important episode for you because I've known you're you were a fan of this movie, and like I mentioned earlier, listeners, if I wasn't firing on cylinders, look, I've been on one podcast in my entire life and that was <laughs> you on did a, you did a great job yo, and that was uh, on don't, don't take a guess <laughs> yeah okay i know but look that's on halloween yeah my favorite series 
But this man chooses the curse of Michael Myers for me <laughs> as my podcast debut. Fast forward when I'm like a major podcast guy, you guys are going to be like, yo, his first podcast was on the worst fucking movie. His second <laughs> podcast was on the best fucking movie. You you had levels, man. You had levels like nobody else. Fucking that's a hundred percent increase. <laughs> yo, that's gains, bro. Yeah. Uh, no, you did a fantastic job on both episodes. I loved having you on Halloween. And, yeah. you know, we've been best friends for so long that it, it took way too long to get you on the show, first of all. Yeah. And it also took way too long for us to talk about – I feel like we've never really talked about Halloween in depth as we did when we no. did that episode. And The Shining, like we're doing on this episode. So we're exactly. finally getting, I mean, getting to is, really – all we've watched them together probably mm-hmm. numerous times. We just – Never go in really depth about, about it like this. Yeah. Yeah. And we now this is cemented it. in history. We've got three plus hours of it's recorded. Shining. It's, yeah. It's in yeah. it's in the books. Um and this is the season four finale. So like we're Whoa. we're done. We're done for the year, man. Like I'm so exhausted. We finally made it across the finish line. This show does take a lot out of me, and we do it for literally half a year when we do it. We do it for twenty six weeks. So I'm exhausted. I'm ready to take my long deserved break. Um, but that doesn't mean that you, the listener, have to wait until we come back to really enjoy the show because not only do we have, of course, the back catalog with over a hundred episodes for you to listen to, uh, we're gonna be sprinkling some bonus episodes uh throughout the off season. Now, I don't wanna get too into much about what these episodes are, mostly because Mally uh, doesn't really know about a lot of them, <laughs> but that sounds right. Uh, there's a commentary we're talking about doing, like a live commentary Ooh. that you can sync up uh, with a movie. No, we're talking about a special celebration now that we've crossed a hundred episodes, where we talk about uh, more meta stuff regarding the show that I think is going to be real fun, and possibly a movie, an interactive movie we're talking about covering as well as a bonus episode. So. It's it's a lot of exciting stuff coming up uh, that, you know, like I said, Mally, when he comes back, is going to be forced to do because he's got to make up. Because this is the first fucking time uh, one of us on. has been so, absent from an episode. Look, <laughs> Dustin, look, I know this is your show, but all right, so, guys, give him a break, all right? Look, Dustin, you don't owe them anything, all right? Look. I don't, they, but I... I I am a I'm a welcoming look, host. Like I like to be them, a good look, host. You'll be you'll get Mally and Dustin after their break, whenever they feel like it. If they want to take longer, they'll take longer. Okay, you'll be yeah, sitting. It, it, it won't be as long of a break that was between seasons one hey, and two, Dustin, which was like a no, year. Hey, hey, hush! <laughs> no, you're doing all this work. No, you guys will get it when you get it. <laughs> all right, be uh, patient. I can't even bring myself to say that. But thank no, I'm you, kidding. thank yeah, you for no, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. They'll be like, dude, um, for his second podcast, this dude's got some balls. <laughs> yeah, you're filling in from now on. You're just taking over. Mally's dead and he's not coming back. I'm just like the sick guy. Like, <laughs> when you're sick, it'd be me and Mally and then... Well, that's the thing, too. Like, I, we, it's pretty impressive. We managed to do over 100 episodes without either of us calling out. Like, I mean, and this was super unfortunate because it was like all the wrong things happened. Like, COVID happened. Un- uh, you know, the film industry crashed. It's coming back up. And like the the stars just didn't align for this one particular episode, but yeah, it, not I mean, to say it, that this episode was cheapened by Mally not being here. I still think we did a bang up fucking job. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I, I took in a lot of work, and like I, we talked about, I got tons of notes. Yeah, I didn't talk about everything, but I'm glad I had it. And actually, I yeah, found out I really we, enjoyed. I didn't talk about everything either. Like, I actually, I really enjoyed doing it. Like uh, paying attention extra to a movie than just sitting back there and watching it because i was looking for stuff to talk about yeah i kind of no, enjoyed it, it, it definitely it definitely changes how you see a movie when you have to do it for the show like you writing notes down while you're while you're watching a movie even if you've seen it a thousand times you definitely start to pick up on things you didn't notice before so yeah um but you know you did a you did a great job thank you for filling Thanks, in man. um we'll have you back on again at some point maybe we'll hit a middle of the road movie now that you've done a bad movie and a good movie Maybe we'll yeah. do just like a, I need yeah, just fine. a mediocre like you know yeah Spider Man two you know or something yeah the Sam Raimi whoa whoa oh <sighs> maybe Spider Man three middle of the road movie <laughs> gosh uh, anyway just, I, I just want to get out there with those Nathan numbers I want to be gotcha yeah Nathan yeah. crushed it this season so we'll have to shout have out him to back Nathan. on too shout out to Nathan uh, especially if you've made it this far into the episode so. 
thank you so so much to you the listener if you've made it this far as well that's true dedication uh Yo, which, means, love. <laughs> which means if you've probably made it this far you're probably a fan so we ask you to please take just 10 15 seconds out of your time to subscribe and rate wherever you are right now itunes spotify wherever you can just give us a little rating a star rating whatever number you want to give us it doesn't even have to be five stars i don't care but the more star ratings we get the more people that find us and the easier it is for people to get into our show the more uh listeners we have always ends up with better quality show i feel like so uh thank you for listening to this episode thank you for being a fan of the several lines playlist as a whole i hope that you've enjoyed our talk about the shining and all the movies we've covered on the show uh i really really love doing this show uh, I know Priscilla hates it, so uh, I'm really glad that uh, we have the fans that we do. Like the numbers we get are pretty impressive. I feel like for two just two dudes talking about movies. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. This has been a great season. I can't wait to get to season five, but I damn damn sure am going to enjoy this break. <laughs> <laughs> right. Enjoy my holidays. I hope I hope you all enjoy your holidays too. Uh, don't forget to vote. Uh, the election is next week, so you've got like eight days. Please vote. That's very, very important. Um, extremely. Extremely important. But uh, again, thank you for listening to the show. Subscribe wherever you are. Um, leave us some feedback. If you want to follow us on social media to get uh, info about those special episodes when they come out, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, as well as Reddit. If you just search for the Silver Linings Playlist. I'm sure you'll get a lot of results for the Silver Lines Playbook, but uh, just, you know, filter through those and you'll find us. I'm sure we'll like the top results for all that stuff. Now, I don't have a clue for next week, uh, but I didn't let you know that there are some bonus episodes coming out. So, again, thank you so much for a great season, for crossing that 100 episodes thresh line, threshold, finish line. I think I combined two words there. I'm all talked out i'm just speaking gibberish at this point i was just thinking about that too i've been stuttering and stuff i was like well i've been talking for three hours straight (laughs) but again thank you jt thank you the listener absolutely we'll see you in the off season on the bonus episodes and sometime in 2021 in season five uh where i'm sure we're going to start the season off with another aronofsky movie keeping that that uh tradition rolling uh we're kind of running out of aronofsky movies here so we got a very small handful to pick from. But again, talking long. Thank you for listening. Uh, subscribe, rate, all that good stuff. And for one last time this season, as always, Excelsior. Oh, man, I was supposed to say that with you, wasn't it? Excelsior! 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 Oh, look it up. Oh.